And Carolyn Glick, welcome to the program. Hi, Josh. Thanks for having me on your show today. Thanks so much for coming on. You know, Carolyn, this reminds me of about 10 years ago when we had some of these conversations actually off the air. I was running the J-Post studios, and you were embedded with the U.S. Armed Forces in Iraq. And uh, I remember I was the one who was filing your reports. For me, those are good memories. Uh, I don't know for you uh, what that does at this point. What are your feelings? Well, you know, it's bittersweet because um, it was eight years ago. It was in 2003, and um, it was very exhilarating to see the American uh, military going in there and uh, defeating their enemy, Saddam Hussein. The problem is, is that in the intervening eight years, a lot has happened. And today when we look at uh, the situation in Iraq with the on the eve of the American uh, troop departure from the country, we realize that... Um, for all of the good things that they did, including taking down Saddam Hussein, first and foremost, uh, the Americans are now about to leave Iraq, and the chances that Iran becomes the dominant power in that country are, are quite high. And so uh, it makes you wonder what it was all about if uh, at the end of the day, eight years later, the Americans are pulling out and the Iranians are going to be taking over. Yeah, you mentioned Iran. I was going to ask you about that. Um, you've called for Israel to act now yeah. to thwart the Iranian nuclear ambition. Will Israel act, and will it be in time, in your assessment? I mean, the optimal time for Israel to have acted would have been in 2008, um, when uh, Bush was still president, and uh, uh, we could have uh, taken care of things. Iran uh, was further behind in its nuclear program than it is today, and uh, it was more contained. Uh, we didn't act then. Um, you know, the problem is is that everybody says correctly that the United States' ability to take out Iran's nuclear installations is much greater than Israel's, but under Barack Obama, the United States isn't going to do anything. So that leaves it to Israel to take care of it, and um, we better do it, because if Iran becomes a nuclear power, as it's on the cusp of becoming, it's also going to become the hegemonic power of the Middle East, and it's going to fundamentally transform the strategic situation in the Middle East without even firing a nuclear weapon in terms of Israel's options for defending itself against Iranian proxies. And when you look at the situation in Egypt being transformed from a country that is at peace with Israel into a country that's going to be led by radical Islamists who are allied with Iran from the Muslim Brotherhood, uh, you see that uh, a situation in which Iran has a bomb is going to be a situation in which Israel is going to uh, have a very, very, very hard time defending itself from aggression. So can can Bibi do anything at this point? Will he do anything in your assessment? You no, know, I'm not a mind reader. Right. I know that Netanyahu for the past, uh, well, I mean, 15 years or so since his first tenure as prime minister in the 1990s has been highlighting the Iranian threat as a primary threat, and I know that he's been uh, really uh, um, focused on Iran since he took off at this time, um, and I just have to hope that he has the uh, the intestinal fortitude to do his job, which is to defend Israel, and that requires him to attack Iran, even against the wishes of an American president who seems more intent on protecting Iran from Israeli attack on its nuclear installations than protecting Israel and the United States from the threat of an Iran armed with nuclear weapons. Very scary stuff, and I'm going to switch gears on you here. Last week's column in the J-Post, you said that if the so-called Palestinians, and I say so-called because I don't like using that word, if they control over, if they take control over Judea and Samaria, that will lead to a terror state. So Israel has two options. That's what you said. Either annex Judea and Samaria or be destroyed. Can you please explain uh, your reasons for taking that position? He really makes me sound so glum, but you know this is part of the uh, increasingly complex threat environment that we're facing today, which is that you know we saw in South Lebanon when we when we withdrew, we didn't get a peaceful border. We got Hezbollah in charge of southern Lebanon, and then uh, and today Hezbollah and through you know Iran through Hezbollah is in charge of all of Lebanon. We left Gaza, and we didn't get uh, a Palestinian uh, state in Gaza that uh, turned into the Middle Eastern version of Singapore, as we were promised by Ariel Sharon and Sipi Livni and Aud Olmert and all the rest of them. We got a uh, an Iranian an Iranian proxy of Hamastan that is a terrorist state that is armed by Iran and 
and uh, funded by Iran and, of course, uh, indirectly by Israel and the United States through the money to the, to the Palestinian Authority. And uh, we know that uh, the exact same thing will happen in Judea and Samaria in the event that Israel insanely decides to follow the prescriptions of uh, uh, Sibi Livni and the left and, and uh, the American uh, president. And withdraw only the worst part about Judea and Samaria is that it is far more strategically uh, imperative for Israel to keep those areas, to defend itself not only from uh, terrorism, a terrorist assault from the Arabs inside of Judea and Samaria, or from their ability to incite uh, Arab Israelis to rise up against a shrunken Israel with indefensible borders. The problem is that without the Jordan Valley and without the hills of Samaria, Israel has no natural defenses against foreign invasion. And so when we're looking at the situation in Iraq on the eve of the American departure, when we're looking at the situation in Jordan, which is also on the verge of top, being toppled just as it's happening in Syria and it's happened in Egypt and, and in Tunisia and, and uh, elsewhere in the Arab world, uh, we see that uh, actually in the years to come the threat of conventional war of land warfare with Arab armies is increased, is increasing before our eyes. So, you know, at a time like this, um, at a minimum, Israel has to hunker down and not give away any land and not uh, do anything that in any way mitigates its ability to defend itself. And certainly a wise leadership of Israel would be doing everything possible to expand Israel's ability to defend itself. And, and amongst those things, it's very important to reassert full Israeli control and indeed sovereignty over Judea and Samaria. Now you said you're glum, and you know what? You are glum, but and I've always had I, I haven't had the guts. I always wanted to write a letter to the editor saying, I wish Carolyn Glick would stop writing. Not because I don't want to hear your opinions, but I wish people would listen to you already so you wouldn't have to write glum columns, but unfortunately that's the reality of the situation. Well, no, the truth is is that I'm glum about the, the strategic challenges facing Israel, but I'm pretty optimistic about our ability to um, to meet those challenges and to right. emerge uh, and, and to emerge uh, stronger and victorious. It's the problem is, is that we have to recognize and we have to recognize that it's our responsibility to do so, and that's really the thing that makes me most glum. It's not that the rising forces against us are are too great for us. I don't think that they are, but uh, the thing that's most important is for us to recognize that it's our responsibility to stand up to them and to defend ourselves. Absolutely. I want to, you spoke the other day, I was with you in Hebron. Mm -hmm. Hebron, you spoke at a conference about Israeli sovereignty and the need to, to reassert our control over Judea and Samaria. And you, you're, in your opinion, number one, we need to do this quietly, similar to the way we did in the Golan that is annexed the Golan and in so-called East Jerusalem, the eastern half of the city. Um, can we realistically do this with Obama in the White House? That's number one. And uh, what about down the road? If we have a more friendly prime minister, do you think the Israeli government will? Uh, I know you're not a mind reader, but do you think we can take those steps in order to reassert our control for those very reasons you mentioned just a minute ago, which is our strategic needs and preventing an invading army coming in from the east? Well, you know, I think that uh, with Obama it will be difficult. I mean, he he would respond violently to such a behavior by Israel. On the other hand, it really depends on what the situation is with his re-election campaign and with Congress. I think that it would be better to, if we can, you know, to wait until uh, a new president is elected and uh, wait for the day of the inauguration and do it then, because, you know, the, the faster we do it, the better. Um and uh, I, I personally consider Obama himself to be a threat to Israel. And so, um, um, you know, it's sort of like uh, when you're when you're with a crazy person in a room, you don't want to make any sudden moves. And, right. uh, and it's the sort of feeling that I get with Obama because he takes every opportunity to to aggress against Israel. Uh, and um, certainly, this would would uh, be providing with an with an opportunity. On the other hand, I think that it's very important while he is president of the United States for Israel to be having a lot of discussions about this and talking about it both amongst ourselves and internationally to set the conditions uh, both most importantly domestically but also in, in the United States in particular uh, for uh, such a, an action by the Israeli government uh, after uh, Obama is out of office which will hopefully be soon. On the other hand, if he does have a second term 
um, if he is reelected, then uh, in all in all pos- in all probability, we're going to have a uh, Republican. Uh, controlled Senate and Republican controlled House, which will right. change the balance of power in, in Washington. And again, if Israel does the proper educational uh, activities in Washington in the next year or so, I think that uh, the Congress and the Senate would be able to constrain to a large degree the ability of, of uh, what would be a lame duck president to uh, take uh, action against Israel. That is that is so important. Now, I do want to get to Latma, but I have one more serious – not that Latma is not serious, but I want to talk about the comedy, satirical Hasbara, as I call it. I want to get to that, but one last question in this regard. What is all this flip-flopping? I mean, you had Ariel Sharon and Hoot Olmert and, of course, Sippy Livni, whose father was in the Etzel. Um, you know, at least with, with Ehud Barak or Shimon Peres, you know what you have. You know what they represent. But what is the story here? Why does this happen time and time again, in your opinion? Somebody who – either starts from the right or at least leads a rightist campaign. And when they get in the hot seat, Sharon Olmert, and then you have Livni, who uh, hopefully will never be prime minister. Uh, what's with that? Why do they keep flip-flopping when they, get in, when they get strength, power, or they get in that hot seat? 